This is the recording and summary of Sprout Labs How to Make Learning Stick webinar. Our webinars are fairly interactive experiences. Um, we don't actually record them because we feel like that actually limits, limits people's um, interactions during the session. What's been ha starting to happen is there's so much great interaction during the sessions of what I'm doing with these recordings um, that I do afterwards is actually add some of the bits and pieces of what people have been saying during some of the whiteboarding sessions to the webinar and trying to um, summarise and communicate some of those ideas. So first of all, just a little bit about what Sprout Labs does. We're essentially a digital learning organisation and we help people design learning ecosystems that accelerate expertise. We work across four areas. Um, most of our projects um, work on what I call a strategy first approach. This might be um, a strategy for a blueprint. Then we move into helping people with um, doing design and development across the 70-20-10. So we do blended learning, social learning, as well as the classic um, digital learning experiences. We have a number of technologies that I'll actually end up mentioning a few times in this record, recording that help us enable um, really new and really different types of learning as well. Because we work with the 70-20-10 model, um, most of our learning experiences are uh, more complicated than a build it and, and they will come. So we actually then help organisations implement programs and mentor them, do things like um, provide coaching support for people that are social facilitators and, and make sure it really happens. So what I'm talking about in this recording is a little bit about um, how 70-20-10 learning model can be used to make formal learning more effective, um, some instructional design approaches to increase retention, the role of line managers in learning transfer, and a bit on learning technologies to enable learning transfer as well. I'm saying a bit because some of these things, just even like the line manager's role in learning transfer can actually become whole webinars on quite large topics and likewise digital learning as well. Now, the other thing is this recording is a little bit shorter, probably actually quite a lot shorter than the actual sessions we have because essentially I'm only doing a summary of the interactive elements. So one of the really interesting things for me from the webinar was this gauge that we put through on this organisation, the way other organisations were around learning transfer. Normally we find that people are actually quite de we normally quite often do it around adoption of the 70-20-10 learning model and people are towards the bottom. What was interesting with this group of people, and I think it probably is actually because lots of people do think about learning transfer, is there were a lot, of, a lot more people in the middle and up to high where they were actually really thinking about what learning transfer really is and how to actually happen and it is a daily part of what they're doing. So my first question to the group was actually what does this idea of learning transfer mean to them. So some of the things we sort of got back from that, and I'll just refer back to the notes, were things like the ability to apply learning, um, identifying the competencies, seeing learning in action, uh, applying learning on the job, the ability of learning, learners to put into place, which is actually interesting because um, it's about the sort of putting into place, which is interesting. Uh, where people actually take away le learning knowledge and skills and behaviours, um, applying the knowledge in, the, in applying learning in the context of developing competencies as well. So for me, one of my really interesting learning experiences recently was a conversation with um, Kath Granger from Fort Hill Company what, during a podcast interview. So um, she's a guru and exper extremely experienced on the area of learning transfer. And some of the questions I set up during the podcast were really around that word learning transfer. And they've got a new tool called 7020 that I'll talk a little bit, bit about later. And she all of a sudden started to work, use this word activate learning. And when I drilled into this a little bit more, she sort of sat there and said, learning transfer is almost part of learning and development and training jargon, whereas she's finding that this term activating learning really expresses the whole getting things happening in the workplace, which was very, very much the theme that happened from people's def definitions. So I'm actually starting to adopt personally this term activate learning 
rather than learning transfer and I, I probably during this recording use them interchangeably because I think this sort of rebranding of learning transfer as activating learning is a really nice way of explaining it in a, in, in a non-jargonistic way. So we've all seen this forgetting curve, which I actually find in terms of being a learning and development professional a little bit scary, that people don't naturally, um, and especially with traditional knowledge-based um, delivery of programs, people don't naturally remember or take on the new behaviour skills and, and knowledge. That this is what we're sort of fighting against, is our, it's actually the brain's ability to be form habits very quickly and then the fact that it's actually quite often very hard to break habits. So a little bit about 70-20-10. Um, 70-20-10 is a really interesting learning model. Um, it's a model, it's not a framework. Um, we've put together a bit of a framework that includes some principles, a process that's driven by design thinking and some design patterns to try to give it a little bit more sort of strength and ways of thinking about how to make it really happen in, in organisations. So the design patterns come from a um, Finnish academic who sorted essentially the functions of L&D into um, three different areas. Sharing knowledge, the classic conduct, um, induction and orientation programs, um, Generating new knowledge, which is a really new function for L and D, and then bringing in new 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 or new knowledge. So she sorted the L and D area into those three functions, and then what we've done is developed some um, patterns and ways of thinking about problems, which sort of fit with each one of those functions, and then sit there and go, okay, so this is means that this type of um, learning experience is new knowledge, which means in this case it's about bringing things in quite often through formal learning and then bringing them in and using the 20s to support that and also making the 70 happen as well. So the other side of it is a process and I'm not going to talk extensively about this but it's one of the things with activating learning and learning transfer that almost the most important thing is making sure that the foundations are right. Um, there's the right solution for the right learning problem, the right solution for the organisation, the right solution for the learners. And that really happens during the understanding, analysis, and analysing and diagnostic stage of a project. Um, I've actually done other webinars that just focused on that particular thing and, that, and some processes and ideas around that as well. So I'm not going to drill into that, that extensively today. There's really two keys for um, learning transfer, and that is accountability and then also line managers' involvement. Accountability because essentially learning's about change, um, and someone needs to be accountable for that. I think this is one of the things we really struggle with in learning development in, in workplaces is we don't actually think about who's accountable for the change to happen. Um, we don't think through, is it the line managers that are going to be accountable for it? Is it the participants? Is it L&D itself? Is it a senior manager or the sponsoring it? And really thinking through that accountability really puts things in a really different sort of spot. The other side of it, and it's been repeatedly found that um, people's line managers are essentially the key to learning and development happening for an individual in an organisation. So to just spend a little bit of time talking about line managers' involvement in training, um, I think of it as being the glue in the middle of the 70-20-10 model. So the, it's quite nice that the 20 sits in the middle. Um, I think of it as the, something might happen in the 10 as formal learning. It's actually the managers or coaches or social learning in the middle of the 20 that then makes sure that transfers into actual behaviour in the 70. Another thing that's interesting as well, I think, and quite often we have people ask us, how do you design the 70? How do you make 70 activities happen? Actually, quite often you make the 70 of people doing things and, and learning by experiencing experiences by designing social learning experiences, designing things like mentoring, 
coaching programs and um, or uh, and I'll talk a little bit about them later mirroring and some of those other sorts of approaches are actually sort of go together with 70 and 20s nicely. The way I think about this role of um, line managers involvement is managers as learning leaders um, and it's this sort of notion that they can be the key to making learning happen and one of the things especially if you're working in a spot where you've got for formal learning happening in the 10 you're bringing in new knowledge and you need to actually involve managers in this in, in, in certain ways and I think one of the most powerful ways is what I call impact conversations and building these into your programs where, where essentially it might happen, um, an impact ha conversation might happen before a learning event or experience. I'm trying to use event or experience because I'm meaning something that sort of might be a face-to-face -face event, might be a virtual classroom, might be an e-learning e um, module, and then happens afterwards as well. And the sort of con questions that happen during these sort of impact conversation is what's the outcome for the um, learning program, um, how it's going to change the individual's performance, but also the manager um, asking how it's going to change the wider team. I, I, my example that I've got is, um, and, and think through that, you, is quite often you've, organizations and teams will send someone up to a project management course and not really think through, well, what does that mean for the rest of the team? Do the in terms of project management, if that's possibly a different project management methodology to what everyone else has been using, if it's not thought about then how the rest of the team is going to change and how that might be implemented, it's really just a waste of everyone's time and money, which is also partly about this question about what do you need from me. Um, other sort of powerful questions that just include uh, what are your big takeaways for the course, um, what have you learned? What's next? What do you need to implement? Cool. So we did then did an act, a exercise around barriers and, and enablers. I've just grabbed a note to get on this one. So classic barriers are, are preconceived ideas about um, what training should be um, and the fact that it's not their responsibility. Lots of things that came up about time, uh, but also around um, line managers' capabilities and confidence. And I think this is one of those things which is is one of our challenges in modern workplaces where we're expecting people to be learning leaders and coaches, but we don't always give them the skills to be able to do, do that. Um, they also just possibly see it as not part of their focus as well. Um, enablers, getting them involved really early in building the strategy. Um, having them co commit to a business goal, um, giving them things like conversation guides, starter tools, and including things around um, what have you learnt recently as standing items in team, me team meetings, um, and also making them really clear on what the value proposition is, and that if they're helping them, their team learn better, they're actually helping their team perform better which then has a link, hopefully, to business goals if it's all directly aligned. So then during the session, we did a couple of little um, scenarios around Rebecca. Rebecca's my fictional L&D person that I sometimes refer back to. And Rebecca's business problem in this particular scenario is she has got a report writing program and she wants to apply the 70-20-10 learning model. So even as I'm starting to talk through the next stage of things, think about how this might be able to be applied in terms of that particular learning problem. There's two really common approaches to activating learning. Um, I'm going to talk about the first approach first, which is quite I've labelled as supporting transfer. And this is really quite a common thing where a trainer might come in, do a learning experience, there might be some setup beforehand, and then there's follow-up afterwards. And this follow-up might be some things like reminders or workplace activities or workplace assessments. Um, but there's still really one single big learning experience. Some variations on this might be uh, like a day-long course and then a three-hour follow-up session. So 
one of the things I wanted to do was actually just think a little bit and talk a little bit about how the actual learning experiences can be rethought as well to actually rethink around how um, by actually making learning experiences different we can actually possibly increase learning transfer because one of the things that's possibly that we, we a lot of the time we work in a way in which our learning experiences are about knowledge and um, skills and not always about behavioural changes and there's things, some things in thinking that can sort of help with that. Um, it's this notion in the web and possibly even in learning and development that content is king. I hear people talk about learning content um, and in the first layer of really what our digital learning and digital web was, it was really about content, it was about publishing, putting things online, getting things, things out there, there in terms of putting them in, into an electronic format. The process is really key in learning. Learning's about behavioural change, which is process. Learning's an experience. Change is, is not, not, just about, not just about knowing something, it's about doing something differently. So, in some ways, it's about rethinking the learning experiences so they actually are more process focused, less content driven, and becoming more more focused on performance. So, we quite often talk about this notion of performance focused learning. Uh, Kathy Moore's nice little mantra is focusing on what the learners need to do. There's two sort of parts to this that we've found work really well. And I'm just going to drill into this. One is establishing the authentic work, work context and then prompting the decision as well. So establishing the authentic work context is really about asking these sorts of questions about where's something happening, who's involved, um, when's it happening, and what sort of feeling and relationships are happening at the same time. So this can also then start to define in terms of um, digital learning experiences what something might look like if it's actually um, happening in an office you might be able to simulate an office if it's something to do with a meeting you might be able to simulate a meeting the who's involved is the characters um, and then that sort of expands to, to making it more realistic and trying to make it more authentic I think the thing that's interesting in the scenario I chose quite deliberately around Rebecca's problem with the report writing is the authentic context of where it's happening is in a Word document. Who's involved? Normally the person who's writing it, maybe people who are reviewing it. Um, because it actually is words, it's very likely the interface for the actual learning experience that would need to be heavily word-driven. Um, that's actually trying to make it into something else would actually deny the authentic learning experience of it. So then the next stage of it is, is prompting the decision. Um, this statement of, of um, focusing on what the learners need to do, we actually find subject matter experts find quite challenging. So we put together these sort of questions to try to prompt people um, to help them make that sort of sense of well, what are the options, what's the consequences of each, which one's the preferred option. Sometimes there's maybe more than one preferred option. Sometimes they, there's semi-right answers. Um, and then what's also the barriers as well. So this leads really nicely into actually being able to do um, activity design and learning experiences as well. Um, so essentially you might sort of be able to sit there and think this actually leads nicely into literally designing a multiple choice question or a branching scenario. Now, the other approach to learning design that I wanted to talk about that's sort of really quite similar is the Aegis model. Um, and it's similar because it's sort of got this notion of generating things and spacing. The Aegis model um, comes from this group of people. Um, I'm more familiar with the work of David Rock than anyone. Um, David Rock's been working for a number of years taking neuroscience research around learning and repackaging and applying it to um, workplace learning. The ages, especially around coaching, and the ages model came and developed out of that sort of coaching situation where essentially it's this notion of you get someone's attention, 
quite often using emotion. You ask questions to help them generate their own understanding. Um, once they have that understanding, link that to emotion that's important to them and then keep on doing that over a period of time of spacing that out so that it actually isn't just a one-off particular thing. It's a really quite a powerful way of being able to think through the design and a bigger picture of things rather than the performance focus one which almost starts to focus on activity design as well. Now back to these ideas around follow-ups. So some of the ideas that during the session I put forward were um, things like action plans, goals, these are classic things, um, workplace projects that might be assessed, discussion forums, um, a lot of the digital learning tools around helping learning transfers are about reminders, and then workplace tasks that are not always as big and complicated as projects and then also embedding assessment. There's lots of other ones as well, and I actually opened up to the group a little bit later around what some of those were, and I'll talk about those. The ones I just want to drill into for a moment are the workplace tasks. So this is things like um, interviewing people, um, reviewing other people's work, parallel practice, where, so, you know, example of the report writing, um, someone who's an experienced report writer, might actually do a report and then someone who's a novice who's learning might do the same report and then they compare. Um, mentoring uh, and then also exchanging and the reviewing process of looking and reviewing at someone else's work is a really valuable, valuable one as well. Um, we've actually got an ebook called Building Expertise which actually drills into, into a bit more detail and lists some more other workplace style activities as well. Some of the sort of digital learning tools that enable and help support some of this style of learning um, yeah, yeah, are the 7020 tool um, that I talked about from Port Hill Company before. I particularly like it. It's been optimised for both desktop as well as mobile. Um, it allows a learner or a manager or a trainer or a consultant to set a goal then what happens is the participant um, uploads evidence towards that goal. That could be photographs, text, documents, all in a social environment, and then sort of at the same time gauging their process towards their go that goal. And then when, when they hit that goal, their line manager confirms that as well. So there's some assessment side of this as well. Um, Anoxify is a full um, adaptive fo format which sort of pushes different types of learning out over time um, and then Sprout Lab's own tool um, Glasshouse can do some of this sort of rem sending out reminders after something or splitting it up into smaller smaller bits as well which is part of the reason we have this sort of strong inf interest in the possibilities of learning transfer as well. But it's not always about actually new tools. Some of the same tools that are used for sending out reminders about compliance training can actually be harnessed for doing exactly this sort of sending out reminders to make sure people keep engaged. Um, also, email newsletter tools like MailChimp um, can be used in a way where once someone sits, goes to a certain page or signs up to something, they can be then sent a sequence of email messages afterwards. So it's not always actually about new tools. There's actually possibly some tools that are, that are in your learning ecosystem um, already or tools that you might find that people like marketing are using that you might be able to harness for internal possibilities. Cool. So I then opened up the group to the group about some other ideas for increasing learning transfer and this was really great. Um, got lots of really good, good ideas. Uh, I'm going to just go through some of those. Um, forums with peers, shadowing, uh, mentoring, getting them to train others, um, development plans, blogging and reviewing and reflecting, uh, building in some ongoing feedback, making sure the learning is happening in the same environment that the um, work's going to be done in afterwards, um, making learners present back to their peers, uh, ongoing learning and support uh, uh, and coaching as well. 
and working out loud, which is a notion of um, being in a group and then sort of sharing constantly what you're doing as well. Cool. So then back to Rebecca. She's in a spot, which is not uncommon. Quite a lot of our clients talk to us about this, that she's found a trainer who only wants to run a face-to-face workshop, and then she has to design some supports around that. So I opened this up as an activity using one of our 70, 20, 10 visual maps. So the idea is you put um, 70 bits onto here, 20 here, and 10 here. Now, this is not an uncommon pro- problem that uh, I think L&D people inside of organizations end up with, where they can only source a sort of vendor that can actually not be in a spot where they, they are able to support a full complicated 70 20 10 model so some of the things that came up in terms of some nice ideas around 20 was things like mentors and co-creation reports um and then building job aids in the 70 and um giving people models to copy and adopt as well um and templates um and it's interesting because some of these things um are actually sort of um, in a spot where it's a mixture of things that happen in the 10, like performance supports that help the 70 happen as well. A um, few people also talked about the idea of a coach in, that's inside the business. This has a really rich learning experience for both the participant and the coach. It possibly gives the coach a chance to do some different things to what they've done in the past um, and accelerate their knowledge in new ways as well. Cool. So the second one was the spaced. So this is actually possibly what I think is the the, the, the ideal model um, for learning transfer. And there's actually been some little bit more jargon around some of this thing, things, and it's possibly begun to some learning jargon, actually. Um, it's sometimes called micro-learning, where you start to try to split the learning experience up into smaller parts. So this is also really good for complex knowledge as well. So you can do better scaffolding of it. So then essentially what you can then do is after each learning experience, you can do some of those follow-up and reminders and and everything that I talked about in the first model can actually be included in this second model as well. They're not sort of mutually exclusive. Just the real difference around this particular model is that the the chunking it into smaller segments actually um, means that you can get more retention of learning happening over time. Depending on how you manage it, it might be also easier to design and build as well. Now, so some of the ideas of the sort of approaches that could be applied in these sorts of spots are things like mobile apps mobile and mobile sites, podcasts to give out content, um, virtual classrooms, which are quite nice because you can sandwich them into hour-long slots and do more of them over time, and including coaching and a um, follow-up that you can do more, more likely will, will be able to work is things like learning logs where you can put them back out over time. And a, and a learning log is a little bit like that working out loud. It's essentially a participant, learner, employee writing up on a regular basis what they've learned, um, how they do it differently, and then um, what they're going to do next time. So it's essentially trying to build reflection into, into processes and work processes as well. So I talked a little bit about the fact that this separating out into different chunks means you can deal with different types of complex learning experiences. Um, so a lot of the work um, we end up finding ourselves doing is that higher on the Bloom's taxonomy, which, so it's still sort of assessing and creating. Um, so it, this <laughs> lends itself to needing different types of learning design approaches. So one one we use quite often is called worked examples. And worked example is essentially a problem, a real life work situation where an expert works through in their thinking process about what's involved in that. Especially in this first example, it sort of shows the thinking through of everything. Then because you can sort of splitting it up into smaller bits, you can then sit there and go, well, here's a partially worked one. Here's some bits done. Here's some of the report done. Um, what do you think about these different options for this section of it? Um, and then 
that might be at that stage just a multiple choice, and then the partially it might be, okay, so here's the situation, here's the report, here's the sections miss missing, write those sections and then send that to your supervisor or manager and get some feedback on that. Um, now one of the interesting things about using these very authentic um, work, work samples to be able to work with things is you sometimes get in a spot where not all the possibilities that need to be explored are there in, in the actual work. Um, those things that might only crop up in one in every um, two years. So you, you do need to then sometimes add part task practice as well. So smaller things that sort of fill those bits and pieces in. So back to Rebecca. And we w went and back went and looked at what a perfect project would look like. And some of the ideas that sort of came back through was still things like face-to-face um, -face workshops at, at in 10, um, but thinking of them a little bit more about a stackable bit um, and making sure the, there's clear business strategies and information support as well. In the 20, um, again, there was some talk about mentoring and coaching and, and forming a community of practice. Um, and also possibly moving the face-to-face -face group from being a um, content-driven to being more like a peer review situation. Um, it's about problem solving together over a period of time um, and then getting really good feedback from each other. So it's a classic sort of moving them between the 70 and 20 of building something that's a group of people that then enables the 70 to happen as well. Cool. So towards the end, just as a bit of a wrap up, um, it was I asked this question about how people could improve learning transfer and activation in their, in their organisation. Included in the summary, because I think there was actually some really nice things. Um, and some of those included things like briefings for external providers, um, linking to the performance outcome, and giving learners the opportunities to coach each other. Um, a few people thought about the idea of mapping the 70-20-10 as one of those things, it's those things as well. Um, and then more bite-sized learning and putting things into more frequencies, frequency things and making things smaller as well. Um, and a few people were also talking about um, the impact conversation idea. I do a little bit of work in the near future around that word impact because I think it's a really powerful learning word. So at the wrap-up of the um, virtual classroom, there's two things. Um, as I said before, our learning content management system, Glasshouse, um, has some spaced learning features. At the moment, these are really about sending out activities and reminders to learners and participants over a period of time based on using email. Um, a couple of clients have talked to us around the notion of trying to do that on a mobile device using push notifications. Um, there's been some recent changes around how some of the push notifications work on mobile devices, which is offering, offering some new possibilities to make it easier. Don't need to do it in apps anymore. Um, so what we're looking for is some people to possibly be involved um, in conversations about what, what their needs around this sort of possibilities around things might be, and also to possibly trial some things as well. Um, the trial content we'll be using and exploring is the role of and possibilities and training people in, in using this, these approaches for coaching skills. Um, then just to touch quickly, the next webinar, uh, which is on the 27th of December, is on how to support managers to become um, learning leaders. Cool. Thank you for listening to this. Um, I hope, hopefully you found it valuable.